Um, a lot of a lot of people have been asking um, uh, us about some some of you guys have missed either yesterday's webinar or the the the, the webinar that happened or took place two days ago. Uh, we are currently under discussion with the management whether we'll be gonna uh, sharing these um, webinars with you guys. So I'll make sure to reach out to whoever is asking about these webinars uh, and see if we can actually get you a recorded version of of the webinars. Um, Nick. Okay, so so Nick is not it's not back in yet. However, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, if you go if you can go back to the previous slide, James. So today we have uh, two speakers. Um, we have uh, Nick White. So Nick is the Senior Associate Director and the Head of Owners Association Services at Asteco Property Management, which is an independent multidisciplined real estate company recognized for involvement in defining the landscape of the Emirates. He brings property management experience from the UK and wide skill set from management construction and civil fields and currently heads up Asteco's jointly owned property portfolio of owners, uh, which compromises of single type and complicated mixed use properties. It is his responsibility to provide the platform from which his colleagues are pushed beyond the normal daily operations and to establish a learning formula aligned with the GE initiatives such as analysis of energy savings, sustainability, streamlining of processes and the ownership of specific projects. So Nick is going to actually um, kick off this presentation by connecting the dots by, on how to assemble a team uh, to better um, help you with any issues that you're facing in your uh, 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 structures. And the second speaker of today is going to be Clyde Ellis. Um, Clyde is the general manager of uh, Dubai's office and he has over 20 years of experience developing innovative design build solutions for owners with commercial buildings and civil infrastructures. His career started in the US where he worked on a design and construction of new post-tension structures. He expanded his expertise working ex on existing buildings with structural issues caused by construction defects and design errors. Since coming to the UAE, he's taken this expertise and combined it with solving durability problems common to the Middle East, such as corrosion, waterproofing failures, and concrete uh, repairs. And as I said, he's currently the general manager of Structural Middle East Branch. Um, not sure if, if Nick is back on. James, Nick is not back on, is he? So I want to apologize again. Uh, where we're just facing some technical issues, um, trying to figure out what's happening. Just give us a couple of minutes. To try to solve this. Uh, <clears throat> Karam, one option is I can actually start um, since both of us are speaking. If you, if you'd like, I'm happy to start my presentation. Um. Yeah, sure, sure. We, we we can do that. We can do that, Clyde. Um, we, maybe we can start with you first, and then we'll see what happens with Nick. And when he's back, um, then we can connect him. Okay. All right. So I'll start sharing. Yep. So so just that everybody's aware, um, Nick was actually going to talk about how how to uh, assemble uh, the 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 best um, team to help you in your, in your assets if you have any issues. However, due to the technical problems that are happening, uh, we will start, we, we're gonna jump on that point at this stage. And Clyde is gonna be talking about the IDB approach and uh, and basically up until Nick comes back and then he'll, he'll start or we'll, we'll go back to, to Nick's part. Okay, perfect. All right, Karam, can you see my screen? Yes, all good. All right, good deal. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for calling in. Um, sorry about the technical difficulty, um, but uh, in today's age of technology, things happen unexpectedly at the last minute. And in fact, we were on 30 minutes prior to this call and everything was running smoothly until just a moment ago. <laughs> so imagine that. Um, but at any rate, I'm happy to uh, jump in and Nick will follow. Uh, Nick will be talking to you about assembling the right team for complex repairs. And I'll be speaking to you about the next three items, which is the investigate design build approach, 
what's it all about, what are the advantages, and how it may apply to owners. And then I'll share some common or some very complex uh, uh, case studies that, uh, that have happened in the region. Okay. All right. So the IDB process. So before I jump into what investigate design build is, what I'd like to do is just first start with the, the typical repair project and what are the steps required to actually launch this project from start to finish. So normally you would start with defining the objectives. The owner typically has a problem and he's trying to understand that problem and to what extent this problem might exist. Secondly, then you would reach out uh, to um, a consultant who would then look at options for repair. And you would decide on what the approach forward might be. The last step would actually be implementation of the repair works and the solution that was discussed in step two. And at the end of that, the owner's problem is solved and this part of the building is handed back over. Now, common participants, in a normal repair project include the owner, the consultant, and a specialist contractor. Now these steps are all very common to us as I'm sure a lot of you have been involved with projects in this mag in this sense, you know, for quite some time. Now if we look at this contracting method, what I wanted to lay out is the components that are required for the traditional design bid build process. So if you can see my mouse here. Normally there's initial planning where an owner says, hey, I have this problem. He's talking within his own organization, trying to understand how this problem may have a business impact. And then next there would be a bid and that bid or tender would go out for investigation and a firm would be hired and that takes a period of time. And then that's normally uh, followed by another tender package for the actual design itself where a consultant is brought in and they start understanding the problem and whether it's a durability problem, a structural problem, so on and so forth. And then you would come to a third bidding phase where you would actually tender for the construction works. And then you would have your contractor go and do the repair. So the point I'm trying to make on this particular slide is that this is a very linear process. And in many cases, you have different people working in silos meaning you may have a lab, you may have a consultant, you may have a contractor. They all play their part in solving the problem. But the point that I wanted to make is that there could be challenges associated with this process. So let me walk you through what I've seen as to be some of these problems. One, for an owner, um, you know, getting to the root cause and understanding its magnitude is, is, is at the top of the list. And why I say that is because if you have a problem you know, that's showing up in the left, you know, corner of your, of your par car park. The question is, is it just there or has it spread other places, but it, perhaps it hasn't shown itself. And then it's transferring that information to a design firm, making sure that they understand when you saw this problem and what you may have done to treat it yourself, if at all. The other part to it is that there's little information known up front about repair costs. And what I have experienced talking to owners is whenever they have a problem, the first question they ask is, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> and that's very, you know, very common. And, uh, and rightfully so, you know, people want to know what they're getting into before they start spending real money. And other things that you might run into, and I won't go through the whole list, but I'll just kind of pick up a couple of other tidbits and then we'll move on, is getting the surprise on bid day. What do I mean by that? I mean that you could have a tender package that goes out and you have five, six contractors who would submit and you would find that the low bidder might be twice as much as your budget. That's a surprise. And most owners, you know, wouldn't expect or plan for that. And then if that should happen, there's associated delays because an owner may say, hey, I don't have that kind of money. We may need to either redesign or rebid. And then you could have the unforeseen conditions as the uh, I've seen on many projects where everything is planned to a T. The consultant has done his job, the contractor has done his job, and then they start drilling or injecting or chipping and they find something completely unexpected, which has an overall impact to the, pro to the project itself. And then that can result in change orders. 
And with change orders comes time and comes additional money. So these are all, you know, if you've been in business long enough, you've experienced these in some form or fashion throughout your career. So I wanted to talk about sort of a, a growing trend in the business that uh, is a different type of delivery system from your traditional design bid build. And what this is, this is an integrated project delivery system. What, we're, what I mean by integrated is that you have the owner, the consultant, and the, proc and the contractor working on this project uh, and having input from the project's inception. So investigate design build is actually a, a type of integrated project delivery where you still have these three parties, the owner, the consultant, and the contractor, but they're being brought together in the investigation stage of the project, and they would stay together throughout the project's completion. So let me talk a little bit more about how this design build uh, uh, procurement method might be an advantage to owners. So first, when I say integrated delivery team, what I mean by that is that the investigation, engineering, design, and implementation, this is all housed under a single project team, okay? So the normally you would start with your condition assessment, there would be laboratory results, that information goes to your design team, and they would start brainstorming solutions. You would have constructability reviews from your contractor who would then be providing input on the solutions as they're being put on paper. And then you actually have the physical implementation or project execution itself. Now, the main points from this is that you have all of the parties working together. That's number one. Additionally, is that you have a collaborative team approach to achieve the common goal. So what do I mean by that? There's, there's really less finger pointing. In fact, I would say there's no finger pointing because when you're dealing with one team, if there is an error, you know, who you're going to point to? You, you know, you're, you're pointing to yourself, right? So if there's a design error, construction defect, uh, something that uh, wasn't expected, you know, everyone is in it together to solve that problem. So you don't have any posturing of different players during different parts of the time. And another thing I like to point out is that, you know, in, in the U.S., we say this quite a lot. We say if there's a problem, you have one throat to choke. And I say that jokingly, but you don't, if you have a problem as an owner, there's one entity that you're dealing with. You're not dealing with different parties to figure out where the problem lies and who's going to solve it. There's really one entity, which makes it easier for an owner to manage. Now, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, you know, integrated uh, delivery system. And let me explain the components and how they may fall in place. So typically, you would have in the initial planning stage, an owner says, hey, I have a problem. And he would put out a performance specification. That specification would outline what the problem is and what the end result is. It would also, um, it would also identify um, warranty. Um, schedule, any constraints, whether it be noise constraints or phasing constraints. And then there's a tender package that would go out and there would, and then there would be a response from an individual team who would actually handle the investigation, design and construction all under one umbrella. Now, the thing that makes, one of the things that makes this a, a, a procurement method of choice is because the time is going to be a lot compre more compressed. And I have some more slides to explain that in more detail. But as you can see from the graphic here, you have overlapping work items between investigation and design. And then you have overlapping work items between design and construction. And that's going to lead to a lot of benefits. And I'm going to get into that in the coming slides. Okay. All right. Computer's moving a little slow. Okay. So what are some of the advantages of, uh, of, of design build? And on the right-hand side, what you see is this is a comparison between design build and your typical design bid build. Okay. So a couple of takeaways. Number one, the unit cost or the cost is going to be lower to the tune of about 6%. The construction speed is actually going to be faster. And I'll show you that. Um, the previous slide outlined it a little bit, but if you have overlapping work activities, obviously the overall construction will be, will be faster, delivery speed will be faster, and there's less likely 
of change orders because all of the components for solution building are working together. Another part is that the cost growth is going to be less, again, because solutions were um, discussed with the contractor at its inception. So therefore, there's less opportunity for unknowns or surprises down the road. And then the overall potential for schedule growth is going to be less to the tune of about 11%. So a couple of things that you'll see as I go into the coming slides is that there's less change orders. Um, you know, commitment to a, a budget happens a lot earlier and enhanced constructability, which gives you higher quality of work. So I'm going to walk you through that in the coming slides. So let me just get into the advantages a little bit more, because if you're like me, you may say, you know, Clyde, um, the numbers look good, but, you know, help me understand that. What's what's the logic behind having a better delivery system and the advantages that come with? So let me let me walk you through that. So I talked about the IDB approach being an integrated team with investigation design and construction. And there's three things that I want to spend a little bit of time on to have a deeper dive in to help you understand the benefits. First, I'm going to be talking about the improved delivery speed. OK, I'll be talking about lower cost overall for your project. And thirdly, I'll be talking about improved quality. So. What I did here on this graphic is this is pretty interesting. So I overlaid the traditional bid build process that you see at the top of the of the chart. And then beneath it, these are the steps that you would have for the investigate design build approach. Now, one thing that's that's quite obvious and I'm sure you'll pick up on it is that the overall construction or let's say handing over the project to the end user is going to be significantly less to the tune of about 33%. And we all know that time is money. If I have a car park and I need to either lease the car park spaces or have people come and park daily, the faster I can get that car park in use, the faster I can generate revenue you know, for, for the owner. Another thing to note out is, the, uh, is you know, what, what actually leads to the reduction in schedule. And I talked about that. It's the overlapping design uh, and construction periods. Okay. Another thing that's also quite obvious is the, these bid components or procurement stages. As you can see for your traditional approach, there's actually three procurement or, or, or bidding stages. And so you're eliminating three of them and you're only having one. So that, that comes, results in, uh, in savings of time. And then the other thing, is that there is less likely to have uh, redesigns and change orders with the design build process. And the reason I say that, and I have a couple of more slides to dig deeper into this, uh, this concept, is that when you have all of the players at the table from day one, solution building is done to a much higher level because great ideas are integrated with constructability and the most optimized solution. And when you have all of the minds thinking together in the beginning, it's going to result in a project that has less change order potential. And for owners, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, less change orders is good news to you. Okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other advantages. Um, as I pointed out, um, you know, that the design build process, you're going to finish earlier. So what does that mean? Let me just move my mouse here. This means that you're going to know the final cost a lot earlier. Okay. Now, the other thing I, I wanted to point out, and, and you can see it highlighted in red, is the contractor involvement. Okay. So for your traditional bid build process, the contractor wouldn't be involved until, you know, until the stage that we see on the, uh, on the graph. However, for the design build, the contractor involvement, as I had just pointed out, is a lot earlier in the process. And we know the biggest cost to solving a problem normally is in the construction bucket. It's the chipping guns, the chip, you know, is the project managers, the general superintendents, the ready mix, the, the, you know, the, uh, the you know, materials, so on and so forth. So when you get your contractor involved earlier, then there is the initial cost is established that much earlier in the process. And typically for the investigate design build process, the contractor can actually give you a guaranteed maximum price 
very early in the process. And I would think that's music to the ears of owners because you always want to know what's it going to cost? What is my final cost going to be? And the earlier you know that, the more time you have to plan for that cost. All right. So this is a, uh, a interesting uh, uh, slide that I wanted to share with you. So in the U.S., there's a, uh, a, a, a I think it's a, it's a, it's a trade publication. It's called the Dodge Report. Okay. And, uh, and Dodge Report, it's sort of like construction. I think in the, in this, in the, in the Middle East here, we have uh, Construction Newsweek, I believe is what it's called. So it's similar. Okay. And what they did was they went out and surveyed owners and they said, owners, help us understand, you know, what are the, the top seven causes of uncertainty on your projects? And if you can see on the, the first column under ranking of importance here for owners, you can see that the top three items that could relate to uncertainty from an owner is unforeseen site conditions. And we, we all know that that can happen. You know, if you're building a new building and you take soil borings and it sounds like you got a good soil capacity, but then you find once you start building, you find areas that are different and you never knew that that's an unforeseen condition. No one can plan for that. And certainly that's at the top of any owner's list. But also owners can have some, you know, some anxiety over errors and omission that could be related to design. So one of the things that this investigate design build process will do is it can help minimize the errors and omission that can result either from design or construction. So I have another, another uh, 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 graph that I wanted to share with you, and I think this is a really, really good way to kind of button all this up um, when I talk about investigate design build. So this is a, uh, uh, there's an architect, uh, his name is Patrick McClamey, and uh, he created this curve. And what you see on the vertical axis is you see uh, um, low to high. This is low to high ability to influence a project, okay? And then at the bottom on the horizontal axis, what you see are the several stages that are required during a construction project from beginning to end. And then that's overlapped with time. Now, this curve that you see here, this shows you a curve that highlights the ability to impact cost on a project. So what does this mean? This means that um, your ideas or a consultant's ideas that are put on paper, you know, could determine what the future cost is going to be. But as those ideas become more concrete and you get a contractor on the board and he starts building, the cost is the cost, right? So that's why you see this curve uh, sloping the way it does. Now, this other curve that you see, this is cost of design changes. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that as you get further into the project and you start building, if there is a design change, it could have a huge impact on your pocketbook. Okay, and so obviously we try to eliminate this as much as possible, but this is the reality. Now, this other curve, this blue curve that you see, this is your traditional bid build process. Now, what I'm trying to highlight is this is when you have all the players at the table. Okay, in the traditional bid build process, your consultant was involved earlier. However, your contractor isn't involved too much later, and the QS is brought on later. So when you have all of the brain power working together on this project, you can see that you know this is happening at a time where the you know the construction is in full swing. But if I take this peak, if you see my arrow, and I just go straight down, if there's a great idea, your contractor says, "Hey, Mr. Owner, I got this." Grand idea. If I do one, two, and three, I could say, you know, it'll be the best thing of all time. I can save you time. I can save you money. But we know as you get further into the construction process, actually going back and changing something could have a huge impact. So you could say, hey, Clyde, you know, if or you can say, hey, Mr. Owner, I can save you a million dirhams, but to go back and redesign it and get the approval and the time effect, it could actually, it, that impact could be more offset the million dirhams of savings. So that's one point that I want to make. Now, with this investigate design build, what I'm trying to highlight here is when you have all the players at the table earlier in the project, what you can see is that if you overlap that with with the uh, the light blue at its peak and you go straight down, what this is telling you is that when you bring everyone together earlier in the project, you're going to have a huge impact on the cost and the overall time it takes to execute the works. So this is a this is a really 
good uh, a curve that I wanted to share with you. I think it makes perfect sense. The earlier you have everyone to the, the seat at the table with all the stakeholders, everybody is singing the same tune. We're marching down the same way. And the solution building is that much better. So the last item I talked about was enhanced quality control. You may say, OK, well, how do I get more quality, Clyde? Well, here, here's, here's a, a really good slide to highlight that. So number one, if you see under investigate, so if you're doing your investigation and as the results are coming in and you're starting to do some analysis, then you have this integrated process, right? As you're, as you're building solutions, um, you're taking in real data and, um, and also the next part to that is the constructability. I'm sorry, the quality control that comes with the actual execution. If you look at this, this other, uh, uh, curve arrow here. So as you're doing the design, your, your consultant is actually going out to the job, making sure the contractor is building as per the specs. So the quality control is much higher during the construction phase. And then this other arrow that you see, the build to the design, what we're trying to highlight is that the earlier contractor can look at your documents, your, your actual, you know, either your, your plans, your specs, then that contractor can be providing constructability reviews. And in my career, I've been on the contracting side for for 20 years, and I've had a lot of consultants come to me and say, hey, Clyde, this is my solution. These are my drawings. What do you think? Is this constructible? Is there something I'm not thinking about that could make your life, you know, either more difficult or easier? So I think, you know, this is a really good good way to, to, to close this part of my talk is just to say that if you have all of these parties working together under one team, then the quality of the overall project will be that much better. So moving on, I wanted to hit just a couple of uh, quick case studies. And these I highlighted because they're complex. You know, I didn't want to take your valuable time to show you traditional issues of, of, of car parks in the region. I wanted you to see some projects that, that are, are unique because, uh, and if you're in business long enough, at some point in time, you, you you will get to wear the unique hat. <laughs> um, so it's good to know you know, how those problems can be solved um, before they happen. Okay, so this first one I wanted to share with you is, uh, uh, and I have this really cool video on the left. Let me just hit, hit this. That's, uh, if you hear that, either in your villa, like I have, or in your car park, <laughs> that is the sound of a problem. And I, and I have to say in your villa, because I've, I've literally heard that in my, in my own home. <laughs> but the, the point I wanted to share with you here, this is this, you know, I just paused the video because it just shows more of the same. What you see here, this is a, uh, a retaining wall um, in a building uh, in Dubai. And this retaining wall is leaking like a sieve. It, I mean, water is pouring out like a river. And, um, and this building has four basement levels. Um, there's a G, uh, ground floor and six typical floors. It's a typical commercial building, nothing special. It's not, you know, a 40 story building and so on and so forth. It's your typical low rise. And, uh, this retaining wall is part of a fresh air ventilation shaft. And this wall, as you can see on the graphic on the right, um, it's not only leaking water, but there's also a structural failure. I mean, this, this is, this is, uh, an extreme case. This is a, a joint that you see. So to the left in this graphic is the, uh, let me move my mouse over if I can get it to move. Okay, this is the wall foundation wall. And then where you see my arrow is here, this is like a block wall. So you can see that corner, that joint has completely failed. Okay, and the other thing that I'll show you in the next uh, coming slides is that this wall actually is separate. It's, uh, there's an expansion joint and there is displacement to the tune of 20 centimeters. Okay. So this graphic here on your left shows you a, pl a partial plan view of this wall, okay? So this, if you see my mouse up and down, this is your retaining wall. So there's dirt on the right. And then you have your block wall that kind of walls off your air ventilation shaft, okay? And from a structural standpoint, you know, let me just lay out a couple of parameters to give you sort of an order of magnitude. So this wall, since it's used for air shaft, it's, it's braced at the raft and it's braced at the ground floor. So it has a 19 meter span. It's not like your normal uh, retaining wall that has a slab bracing it every three meters. So this is spanning 19 meters vertically. And there is a 
expansion joint to separate the wall into two parts uh, vertically. And so what's happened here, if you follow my mouse, this is the expansion joint in that wall. Well, there's actually differential displacement to the tune of 20 centimeters. And, uh, and it's actually bowed out in a similar fashion to what you see um, uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, graphic here. And that's all coming from the soil pressure behind the wall. So obviously there's a structural failure and that structural failure has turned into a water problem. So I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of numbers, but I will just give you a sense of when you see this type, if you know, if you ever see this, like this is red alert, like pick up the phone and make that emergency call. This, this wall um, was overstressed by 800% in flexure and about 80, uh, 80 percent in uh in shear so so what this is telling you this wall you know for all intents and purposes it should have it should have collapsed um so it's a major safety concern and the thing that makes this interesting is that you can't just go in and start chipping you know um because the wall had you have to assume it has no capacity you start chipping the whole thing could come falling down and you know and and there could be loss of life it could be a disaster so when dealing with a complex situation like this, there's many parts you have to consider. And I have a couple of slides just to walk you through some concepts. So one of them is that you got to stabilize a wall like this. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, no one on the planet should step foot inside this air ventilation shaft because it could go at any moment. Um, there was uh, some temporary props put in to brace it at every floor. So maybe every three meters it was braced. But I can tell you when you have uh, a joint that looked the way it did, in the previous slide that has failed. I mean, you're talking huge forces there. And uh, before anyone should get inside of this, you know, starts chipping, they need to stabilize the wall. So this was a solution to stabilize the wall, basically using A-frames, bolting them to the floor, and then the vertical leg put is, is hard up against the existing wall. This is where the forces are the highest, and this is where the bracing of the wall is necessary to kind of stabilize it before you put people in there and start going to work. The other part of the solution, and this, this was, uh, you know, I thought it's, it's, it's pr pretty good idea. So if you have a wall, you know, I, I just imagine if, if you can see me here, you have, you have your left hand, your right hand, each one represents the left and right side of the expansion joint. Okay. And so we know that a wall like that, like a cantilever, it's pretty, it's pretty weak, right? So one solution was to actually, um, cut the span of this wall. Now it's already cut with an expansion joint. But instead of having a cantilever, you know, fixed on one side, a cantilever here, we actually put a diaphragm wall to actually serve as a support. So what does that do? It takes a cantilever wall and it makes it a simply supported wall. So that was one way to also stabilize the wall before you go in and start doing a lot of chipping. And this wall ended up being full height. And then the other part to this is actually now you've stabilized the wall. Now you have to stop the water. Right. And I wanted to point out this all has to be done in a special sequence because um, the moment you stop the water, the load goes up. Right. If you stop water, the pressure builds behind it and then the wall could actually fail. So those first two steps that I just briefly mentioned have to be done with running water. Why? Because you don't want that wall to see any more load while you're trying to stabilize it. So once it's stabilized, then the solution for stopping the water was actually doing curtain a wall grout injection. And what that is, it's a it's a process of replacing the waterproofing on the backside of the wall. OK, so there's two ways to replace waterproofing on the backside. One way is to excavate down, which costs you an arm and a leg. OK, you know, or the other way is to on the front side of the wall, drill some holes at a certain spacing and inject a grout solution on the back side of the wall that would set with a certain time to actually solidify and replace the waterproofing on the back side. So this graphic you see on the on the on the on the bottom left and right, these are packers um, where the injection work is done. This is a chemical solution, so you have to have certain chemistry so that the liquid solidifies within a certain time so that you don't just pump it, you know, into the soil and just keeps going. And it actually uh, would solidify like a, like a gel-like. So, um, so this is what the way that was uh, developed to stop the water. Now, the other part to this is if you build a new wall to strengthen this wall, 
then you have to prevent contaminants from going from one wall to the next. So there's two ways of doing that. Um, one is to put a PVC membrane, but the other thing is to use a dimple uh, drain board. And if you haven't used this before, it's pretty interesting. So a dimple drain board actually says if water gets through, this dimple drain board allows a path for it to go straight to the bottom of the wall where they could, you could have a, uh, a French drain system to move that water out. So this is like a multi-defense type of system to prevent contamination and water from causing problems in the future. And then the last part of it, before I move on to the next case study, is the wall enlargement. Okay, so this is an enlargement from the bottom of the wall all the way to the top. And obviously, the thickness of the wall is less as you go up. Why? Because the loads are less. So this is a really, really interesting case study I wanted to share with you. Um, you know, hopefully you'll never have to make that call. But if you do, this is some ideas of how you might solve it. Now, the next one I wanted to talk about is a corroded PT slab below grade. And the reason I wanted to highlight this one is because um, your problem may not always be the raft slab. I mean, I was going to show case studies to talk about how the raft could be strengthened with spalls and water and so forth. And I'm going to show one like that at the very end. But your problem in, the, in a car park isn't always on the raft. It could be on the wall, as I just showed you. And it also could be the first elevated slab above, which in many cases can be post tension. So for this particular case study here, this is a, a commercial, uh, I would say mixed use tower. Uh, this one is in Abu Dhabi. Um, again, the raft is conventionally reinforced, remaining floors, post tension. And what you see here is, um, is the, the middle graphic here uh, on the right. This, this is a retaining wall and I'm trying to find my mouse. Okay, here's the retaining wall. And then this is the PT slab above. And, and what was found out, you know, I'll just cut to the chase, is that soil on the backside and there was a poor detailing between the PT slab and the retaining wall. The actual retaining wall is like this and the PT slab, instead of stopping like this, it actually extends out a little bit. So you actually have a joint here um, where the raft, I mean the, the, the retaining wall and the PT slab actually extend out. And because of the poor detail, it actually led to contaminants getting to the post-tensioning, which led to severe corrosion. And it caused concerns for the owner in terms of safety. You know, owners always thinking about, hey, if something spalls off and drops on, you know, this uh, million Durham Lamborghini, which in this part of the country, that's you see them every day. Um, or you could have loss of life, you know, where someone gets uh, hit with uh, falling debris or worse yet, you could have some localized failure because these PT tendons are under stress. And if they fail, they snap and they release a lot of energy. So a couple parts of this that I wanted to share with you. Um, Whenever you see a problem like this, um, don't always assume everything is bad, right? Um, normally, you should do some type of investigation to isolate the problem. Is it just in the first bay or is it widespread throughout? And so one way of doing that is to do a tiered investigation. What do I mean by tiered investigation? That means that you just don't come in and, you know, full bore and start chipping, drilling, um, taking cores, dust samples, so on and so forth. What you do is you, you start your investigation in stages. And the first stage would be non-destructive testing, trying to figure out where the bad areas are, okay? Once you find the bad areas, then you can go to semi-destructive testing, which is minimally invasive. This is maybe drilling here, using a boroscope to stick a, stick a small scan camera into the post-tensioning tendons to visibly see whether there is grout or no grout, or moderate corrosion, slight corrosion, or no corrosion. Um, so there's different ways of checking the structural health of your post-tensioning. Um, and then once you get that data, there are tools that can help you determine if bad is bad. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I have slight corrosion, does that mean I need to shore up the structure? If I have heavy corrosion, but it's only on one tendon, do I need to shore it up? So there's standards in the industry that a consultant can use to make that determination with confidence. Also, you can do some investigation or some sampling of the PT grout because that can help you understand if there's chlorides in the grout. You know, believe it or not, not everyone uses potable water to mix the grout. Um, um, it's, it's happened, um, you know, where people didn't do the right thing. 
Um, so, and then once you get all this information, you have to, you know, analyze the data and put it into a report. And these are just some of the results I wanted to share with you. The graphic on the right, this is always one of my, one of my favorite to show you, um, you know, to show people that I'm talking to like this. This is a PT duct where you see the, the, the duct has been peeled back. The strand actually doesn't look that bad, but guess what? There's no grout. Um, normally these ducts are filled with cementitious grout. So, you know, the question becomes, why is there no grout? Um, and if you've been in business long enough, you know, mistakes happen. And this might be one of them where someone just forgot to put pump grout into this tendon. Um, the downside to that, there's two, there's two effects. There's a, there's a structural effect, which I won't get into. But the other part is that the grout serves as a layer of corrosion protection. And without it, the strand is more susceptible to corrosion. So we found incomplete grouting. We also found some corrosion, but the corrosion was actually limited to the first bay. Why? Because that's where the poor detail was that allowed contaminants to get to the post-tensioning. And then we also found that the chlorides were, were um, um, greater than the allowable limit for the areas where we did find grout. So some of the repairs that came out of that, just to kind of give you a sense, you know, you may say to yourself, well, this post-tensioning, it's built in with my concrete. Like, how do I fix it? Well, I can say this, if it's really bad, um, and we found some areas on this project, it was really bad, um, you, you just take it out, you know? And, and what do I mean by that? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it, but in this graphic here, what I'm trying to explain is basically um, locking off the post-tensioning tendons, and there's a way to do that, and I, that's a different conversation, but we would go to where the tendon is good, we would lock it off, which is you see a couple graphics on the bottom left. You expose in your duct. You're removing the grout, the, the grout and the and the duct, cleaning the strands, and then you're putting an epoxy grout in to kind of form an anchorage. So once you lock off the tendon, at that point, then you can start chipping around the bad part of the tendon where there could still be some residual stress. So you're removing concrete, and you're removing the PT, and the solution here, which may seem trivial, is just to replace that reinforcement with conventional mild steel. So basically you're taking out the bad corroded PT section of slab and you're putting the slab back with mild reinforcing steel. So that's one way of dealing with a tendon if you have severe corrosion. Now we found some areas where um, there wasn't any corrosion, but we had grout voids. And we said, you know, what are we, what are we gonna do? How do we fill these grout voids? And so there's a number of different ways of doing it. But one way is to use uh, pressure grouting. Pressure grouting is basically having an inlet, having an outlet, and pumping grout from one to the other. And that grout is pumped under pressure. And the idea is to fill all the voids inside of the duct. So when you do this grouting, though, I wanted to highlight that normally these ducts are pretty small. These ducts are, uh, you know, 25 mm by 75 or, let's say, 100. And they're filled with strands. So the interstitial space between the duct and the strand is quite small. So what am I trying to say? You could have a duct that has some grout, but not fully grouted. And if you have that, that means the void changes shape. Some, it, sometimes it could be like this. Sometimes it could be like that. And it's getting smaller and bigger, you know, along the length of the tendon. Why? Because the tendon has drape and it's actually moving ever so slightly inside of the duct. So in order, the point of this is in order to move grout through these really tiny spaces, what we've done is we've used a process called vacuum assisted grouting. This is where you're pumping grout on one end under pressure, and then you're actually hooked up a vacuum to the opposite end of the void, and you're actually using negative pressure to pull that grout through the duct. So the graphic that you see here, this is just a, a process that I want to share with you where you're actually pulling grout through a very small space inside of a duct using vacuum assisted grouting. Now my last case study before, before I finish up here is uh, this, this might be more common. <laughs> and when I say that is that, you know, finding standing water in your car park, um, I would say is more likely than perhaps the first two examples. And in this particular building, uh, it's no exception. There's water coming into the car park. There's cracks of different widths. And if you can see on the top graphic, actually the slab is starting to bulge near the columns. Now, when you see that, that's, that's a big deal because that means that you don't just have a water problem. Now you have a structural problem. And this is why I put this example in because I wanted to share with you 
a scenario where you have a combination of the two. That's what makes this case study complex. So let me share it with you. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the structural part, because to be honest, that's the root cause here. Um, water coming in, that, that's, the, that's the effect. The cause is that you had a structural issue that caused the slab to be overstressed, and then the waterproofing failed. So what was found, quite interesting, um, is that the water level actually had increased to the tune of one meter over time since the building was originally built. So that was the first finding. And in addition to that, there was also some uh, low concrete strength. You know, low strength can affect the capacity, um, primarily for shear. And we also found some other anomalies with the construction. And so the result is that this slab was overstressed in flexure at the pile cap up to 200%. For shear, it's a lot less, but at the pile cap where the raft and the pile cap come together, that, at that connection is where there was a lot of uh, bending deficiency. And in this middle graphic, while you can't see it all that much, you might see a little plume of, of misty air shooting up. Let me move my mouse over to it. So this was, so, so we went out and drilled a hole in the slab and it was like a geyser, like shot up, like pff, water came, you know, squirting out from this hole. And that kind of shows you what the pressure is like underneath the slab. So a couple more graphics here just to show you the, uh, the water that was found standing at different areas. The water was not only coming from around the, uh, the columns, but it was also coming from the kicker joint. Kicker joint is the joint between the raft slab and the retaining wall. And during this investigation, you know, we, we tried to figure out, you know, where the water's coming from. Obviously, it can come from a structural uh, effect, like I just showed on the previous slides, but we also found that water can come in from any types of joints in your wall or your slab. So it could be, it could be form ties, it could be construction joints, it could be expansion joints. Um, and we found that a combination of all these things were happening in this car park. It just wasn't due to the overstress at the pile cap. It was actually from other areas. So this, this project was, was pretty intricate because <clears throat> if you walk into the structure, you have no idea where the water's coming from. All you see is water everywhere, you know? And the question is, is what hole do I need to plug to stop the water? <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things that we did was to uh, do some pressure injection. Now, this is, um, we typically call this interception uh, injection work. And the idea is to basically inject uh, resin material um, by drilling holes into the, the area where there is uh, a leak, and primarily it's at joints. And we're drilling a hole and stopping mid-depth of the wall. And we do this on a spacing that is designed. And we're basically injecting material there to allow the material to spread in both directions. And we found this to be a very effective way of stopping water coming from construction joints and retaining walls at the raft slab. Now, the other thing to point out is that the deficiencies that I had described earlier. And, you know, for an owner, you know, the numbers you see here may not mean all that much. But let me just, there's two things to point out on this slide, and then we'll keep it moving. One is, is that before you start chipping on your slab that has severe hydrostatic pressure or heavy pressure below, number one, you got to dewater, okay? Um, because chipping into the slab reduces the section and that reduces capacity and that could make your problem worse, okay? So number one is dewatering. The next part is that the areas that were low deficient, we added a bonded overlay. Now, adding a bonded overlay may not seem all that complex. However, you lose head wound when you do that. So there always has to be considerations from an owner perspective of how does the headroom or the lack thereof with MEP and the bonded overlay, how that all might work together. For the areas that were highly deficient, I'll just, just speed up here. For those areas, we needed to actually chip down into the raft, um, Hello. Move, peel back the reinforcing, and then we needed to drill and add in bottom reinforcing where the pile cap and the raft come together. The reason for that is because the bending um, is actually on, on the bottom side. You know, most times for our supports and buildings, we put the top steel on the top. But in this case, because that's because the load is from the top. When the load's from the bottom, 
you got to put reinforcing on the bottom. So this was done here. But the one thing that I wanted to point out, and this is the trick um, when dealing with water, you know, the structural part can be designed, no problem. But when you pour it back, um, you have to make provisions for the possibility of having a leak after the repair is done. So the, the missing element, not missing, but the, the special sauce to this detail is installation of uh, swellable water bars uh, and reinjection hoses at the joints around the pile cap. So in my graphics on the right, you see these little vertical uh, um, you know, boxes, uh, orange boxes, uh, swellable water bars and the grout the reinjection hoses that are put in as a uh, precautionary in the event that water comes after the repair is completed. So these are just a couple of action photos from that work, just to give you a sense. I mean, this is heavy duty work. When you're reinforcing around a pile cap, heavy duty work and requires a lot of special consideration. So just to close out, um, you know, and I'm going to pass this off to Nick and, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. But, um, you know, from an owner perspective, you know, should you be concerned about your basement problems? You know, um, and I can tell you, this is a list of things that you might want to look for. And you don't have to be a rocket science scientist to, you know, make these observations. Do you see rust staining, falling, efflorescence, cracks, um, deflections, um, water leaks? If you're seeing these things, then it makes sense to perhaps look further. And doing it sooner than later can actually save an owner time and money. And the reason I say that, it's sort of like I always liken these problems to like cancer. If you find that you have cancer in stage one, you, you know, um, the, the, the chance of success is much higher. When you find it at stage four, then the outcome is, is on the opposite side of the spectrum. And so my point is, is when you start seeing these signs, the earlier that you can do something um, about them, you could have a smaller bill to come with the potential fix. So what am I trying to say? From my owner perspective, you can either be reactive and wait for it to happen like the graphic on the left, or you can be proactive about it, where you can start understanding the magnitude of these problems, the complexity, and how bad is bad, and when should I act before it goes from a light repair to a more heavy or complex repair. So. As we talked about at the end of all of our other talks, um, basement inspections are a way of getting a health check on your structure. And I took a couple snapshots of what that looks like if your basement is inspected, where you're looking at potential for leaks at expansion joints, cracks, construction joints, uh, leaking pipe penetrations. Also, there's observations about cracks and delaminations. Again, these are all visual observations that uh, as Karam mentioned earlier in our program, that we offer as a complimentary service to help owners understand the health of their structure. There's photos that are typically taken by our specialist who actually goes out to site and does this visual walkthrough. And then at the end of this report, we would actually make some recommendations. Um, you know, some of them could just be, hey, you might wanna replace the expansion joint. You might wanna wash down these areas more often. Um, you might want to do some crack injection, different companies that can do that type of thing. And then it also can kind of give you a roadmap for planning for other works that might affect the use of the structure, you know, further down the road. So the point from this is that this is something that, uh, that, that, that we're offering complimentary. But I think the bigger part and the bigger message is, is that finding out if you have problems earlier could result in a lower cost repair um, and taking that proactive approach, you know, can save a lot of time and headache down the road. So my advice is always, you know, sort of like getting a physical, you know, we all, we're all told to go get a physical once a year. Why? Because we just want to make sure everything is working, everything's clicking together. And if there is something wrong, we can get to it early where we can have a positive impact on our own personal well-being. And I see car parks as the same way. They're like a living organism. And if you take care of it proactively, it's going to last that much longer for you. So that's, that's my uh, concluding slide. I just had a couple of contacts here for uh, people that you can reach out to within our organization. And what I'll do now, um, 
uh, Karam is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it off uh, to Nick, who will uh, button up our talk for today. Yeah, th thanks, Lloyd. Uh, um, Nick, can you, can you try to share your screen? Um, let's see. Let's hope. Oh, let's try this again. We're off and running by the looks of it. You can see that. All good. All good. Yep. All good. So you, you might have noticed that we um, we have purposely illustrated there how a team is brought together, can practice something, and the team members can jump in and help the person who's foundering a little bit. So thank you for to Karam and and James and um, and Clyde then for. Uh, stepping forward earlier in the, uh, the the process to be able to uh, make it seamless as it is. Um, so apologies to everyone for the, the, the glitches in, in the, the start. Um, I will th therefore paraphrase what uh, I'm going to go through um, so that um, we can get to the, to the, to the end product. Um, some of it um, will repeat on some of the, the subjects that Clyde has already. Um, Monday, we talked about um, how we assess to be proactive in maintenance um, uh, and what influences that and when it should happen, best value, um, increasing the service life of the building and decreasing disruption. Um, talking from a manager's perspective, um, then we are always looking to find out what is the most optimal and cost-effective uh, best value way for our clients. And we, we deliver for client, individual clients with portfolios and we deliver to multiple owners uh, within the jointly owned property uh, industry. So that we ha our, our position and viewpoint is that uh, due diligence and care duty of care to other others. It's not our particular uh, ownership um, and it's on behalf of others. So there's a, there's a slight nuance in how you have to approach um, remedy uh, of of anything, any problems in a, in a property. Um, so it's often value for money and uh, the length of service that comes into play rather than the initial uh, low cost, low price. During the decision making, there's, there's many considerations. Um, I mean, the, the, the is what is the risk at that time and the eleven levels of importance of that remedy. Um, as Clyde uh, pointed out earlier, that, that often if the earlier that you approach these, these things, the, the lower the cost over the duration of time. You're also in a position of knowledge. Um, you, you get an expert uh, to assess these. You, you know uh, for sure and certainty that um, you know a third-party assessment can allow you to um, to make some decision decisions that uh, you wouldn't have had before. You don't know what you don't know. Um, there's aspects of warranty that may be in place, but um, third-party assessments are always good so that you know that your warranty contractors. Uh, are doing what they should do um, and again things like disruption to occupants painting of walls and things is is not disruptive whereas um, renewing joints is a uh, car moving and things like that is is so continuing with, with the uh, the manager's decision um, it's how do you bring the tools resources and what are the best best options all together in front of you to be able to deliver on these these remedies and to extend the length of the service life of the building. Um, obviously, uh, inspections and assessments we've talked about, um, planning maintenance so that it levels out the expenditure costs to the owners. Um, so we have a, a finance responsibility there um, for, for the best value. 
Um, and then there's the technical expertise, as you've seen from the, the past three days of webinar. It's, it's very technical and a, a manager position isn't to be technical, technically knowledgeable about those things, but it's knowing the roots and who to go to to be able to get your quick solutions for that. Um, planning, programming, monitoring and certifying are not necessarily the wheelhouse of the manager, so you'd be considering placing a, uh, a consultant in, in that position to be able to deliver those aspects for you. And I know from my personal position that, that you're not just dealing with that one remedial aspect of the building. You've got such an array of other things that you have to think about that it's putting the best people in the best in, in position to deliver um, the, the best solutions quickly. Um, but it, you tend to sometimes to think you can do it all or take it on aspects of, because of cost saving, whereas you're actually lengthening or increasing the cost or lengthening the time that you're spending on an actual project. So these are all aspects that come into our mind when we're trying to select the, the team or how the, the solution, the optimum solution going forward. So the, the plan of action um, has been assessed and then you're looking for the ex expertise and the experience. Um, and there's an element of um, due diligence that because you're a manager, you may not see certain aspects. You may not be au okay fait with the actual uh, project work and the sub consultants and the sp different specialists the that may be involved in the whole of the project and therefore uh, many clients will want to put a consultant in the driving seat and contract with that consultant to then uh, contract with the sub con uh, subcontractors and the specialists to be able to deliver uh, and there's many different formats of that in in a lead consulting uh, management contracting uh, and as Clyde has pointed out in some aspects design and build um, depending on many influenced by many factors of how long the program is the technicality aspects uh, the, the reduction of time uh, technical difficulty and budget so from a manager's perspective there's a certain amount of systematic and, and, and uh, methodology you can go through to to select your team and um, it's the obvious obvious tender process um, pre-qualifying um, companies beforehand so that at least you you know that they have the competence the legal position to to deliver um, the, the projects for you uh, it's important to set up the documents when you're requesting for proposals that it gives your uh, your consultants and contractors an opportunity to show you that they are competent um, and, and enthusiastic and aligned with this kind of work with their track records um, experience etc um, so once you have all of that information in front of you, you then evaluate in a scientific way. You, 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 there's many different ways, but an example is that you would you would put a a matrix together of all the uh, criteria that you're wanting to look at, and then you score those, uh, and which gives you an end score, and you can weight them depending on your values towards uh, how you think the development of the uh, project should be run so you get to a stage where you, you, you have a a method in front of you you have uh, an evaluation breakdown and you you may have one two maybe four five uh, consultants and contractors in the running um, this is where it starts getting to be uh, a little bit fuzzy but you you then to make a uh, a choice of, and to see any differentiating factors between them to get the b best or optimum team together um, you start bringing in other things that aren't so um, black and white and it's, it's a little bit gray um, and there's no no uh, right or wrong way of this this is that it, it's a it's an experience uh, aspect and how you approach these th things so 
Um, just to, to wrap up then, um, a manager would be looking to reduce the risk um, um, and increase the chance of things going right is the other thing. Anything that goes wrong through that process is where the cost happens or the, the actual time of disruption. So those are the elements that we also think about. Uh, and I just to, like to, to for you to consider, and I think this is more of a, a question to end on, that it's maybe not always to do with, with price, but how the interaction of companies, people and players happens when it's a large project that gives you the best outcomes. And there's a sporting term in psychology that's um, it's called flow. And it's it's when the person is so involved that things become very natural and very smooth. But that can happen in working teams as well. Um, and if they're aligned and they're all looking at one goal, um, there's an opportunity for the, the team to become engaged and the outcome becomes um, the, the op most optimum um, that you need. So I think in terms of bringing teams together, it's a good to to also think about some, some of these other aspects of how do you create that team build and that working? Um, and I'll leave that to you to, to find that way because there's no exact science of it. It's, it's all about experience and, and going through those motions. Um, I, I, I hope I uh, managed to deliver a, a circular aspect there to you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I know we, we have been going on for quite a while. So I'll come back to you, um, Carol. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Nick and Clyde. Um, again, I just wanted to apologize for the glitch that we had at the beginning of this webinar. Um, and uh, Clyde and, and Nick, thanks both for sharing what we believe is the new era of procuring maybe such a highly complex projects when it comes to repair or strengthening of existing structures. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that uh, there is a short survey. Um, we'd really appreciate if you just fill that out. You know, as I said earlier, it will better help us help you or serve you down the road with any upcoming events that we want to plan. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, um, uh, I would want to start with a question to Clyde that actually says, so Clyde, you talked about this IDB uh, initiative and how it could save a lot of money. Uh, by bringing by bringing all the stakeholders into the table at an early stage of the of the design of of a project, so the question says that you know I mean there are only a limited number of companies that can actually do that or have that capability to do everything in house. How can a client from a client perspective, how can they make sure that the price that they're getting for if they decide to procure an IDB project is going to be competitive? Right. <clears throat> okay. That's a good question, um, um, and it makes makes perfect sense. So, um, there's a couple of ways to make sure that it's competitively bid. Um, I did talk about earlier how you would have one team working together. Um, some companies have that capability all under one umbrella, but other companies have formed a joint venture in the past to deliver the same uh, quality, high level of service. So what I've seen is I've seen, you know, a contractor A, whoever that is, team with a consultant uh, in, in Dubai, and they bring in a lab. And the three of them work together to respond to an investigate design build tender. So it could be a single company that offers all three, or it can be three separate companies working together to, you know, to respond to a tender. And so IDB can be competitively bid um, in this way to ensure that the owner is getting best value for their money. All right, and one more thing that you discussed, Clyde, is basically that you know with, with the IDB, uh, there is a reduction in the overall schedule. Um, one question says that what about the, basically, um, the, 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 the work items that come in the critical path of the actual construction? Does does the IDB method have any change or, or any reduction in time of the of the of the items that come in the critical path? Um, I would say no. I would say critical path work items would be the same independent of which process. I would say the time you know the, the real time savings is eliminating 
the multiple procurement phases and overlapping work activities between investigation, design, and construction, um, and the less potential for changes that could slow down a construction schedule while the construction process is going. So to me, those are like, you know, there's many ways to slice this thing, but those three items itself will generate the savings that we're talking about. So it's not really work items and the sequencing or, you know, what I, it's, it's really not that. It's really these, these main items that I just pointed out that would, would uh, provide high level of value to an owner. All right. What, what, one question for Nick here says that, so, so from a property management um, um, perspective, so if you had any issues on, on any of your facilities, when, when do you think is, is the right time for you to seek out the assistance of, of maybe a specialist contractor or even a lab or, or, or a consultant to come and assist you? I mean, one of the things that you, you discussed that, you know, the managers that are sitting on, on the job site might not have all the technical information um, to, 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 to understand. Uh, what is exactly happening. However, uh, when is the right time for, for you or your advice people to reach out to, to these specialists um, and seek their, their assistance? Okay, as I pointed out in, in my slides on Monday and uh, today, the, the, there's lots of influencing factors um, and the management of, of the property, you, you have your facility manager on site, that should be able to advise also, um, and you have your own experience. So if you have a good manager, they're, they're experienced in, in looking at these things. But as a general rule, um, the, the earlier that you get involved and in, of understanding what is, the problems may be in, in say, uh, a basement uh, scenario with, with some, some damp areas, some leaks, some effervescence and things like that, that you don't know what's behind that. And so if you're able to, at a budget cost, at least get an, a specialist and expertise to come in and have a look at that, there may be not too much to do. It, it, the cost of remedy may be, may be low, but you've already started um, that, at that point of where you, you start understanding what's going on behind it and know that there may be a, a, a remedy that's over a, a a period of time that keeps those costs very low but they have to happen rather than you leave it and then in five years ten years down the line the 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 problems have become they're no longer fresh in your mind or your eyes are not seeing them for the first time and they get they get delayed even more so I, I think if, it, it's all depending on if influence like budget and and the teams that you've already built and the checklists and the inspections that you're doing, that's, yeah, early is good. All right, thank you. Um, Clyde, there's, there's one more question about, um, you've, you've shown one case study about um, some foundations or podcasts doing some repairs to. Um, the question says, what about if, if these foundations were completely submerged in groundwater? And this groundwater, as you said, you know, we know that it's, it's extremely saline here. So what could be a, a repair? Uh, uh, or a strengthening solution, or how how might you be able to tackle such such issues? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so if the raft has been completely submerged, um, it may not necessarily mean there's a structural problem. It just could mean that water is coming in from someplace. It could be from the kicker joint, for example. Um, um, and uh, so I wouldn't necessarily jump straight to a structural problem uh, or solution um, just because you have, you know, uh, 50 millimeters of water standing in a car park for a period of time when maybe the structure was partially built and construction stopped. So whenever you have something like that happen, what I have seen is there would uh, a consultant would, would um, you know, look at the durability um, associated with the raft and they would uh, take some chloride samples to determine the, uh, the chloride content and the depth of uh, penetration and then based on that information they can do some half cell potential testing to determine uh, the, the critical time you know for for the uh, initiation of, of corrosion and if they should find the uh, you know results that point towards corrosion um, then when the repair is done, um, 
you perhaps need to layer in some type of cathodic protection system to uh, to protect the steel from further corrosion down the road. So uh, standing water doesn't always mean structural. However, and standing water doesn't always mean you need to jump to a cathodic protection solution. But once you get more information and that data suggests that the chlorides have reached the rebar, then you may need to layer in a cathodic protection system in addition to your traditional concrete repairs. All right, I wanted to thank you both, Nick and Clyde, and I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, uh, note that if you have selected that you are interested in a customized webinar, uh, we will be reaching out to you uh, and trying to set up these webinars to your um, firm or your company. Um, we truly appreciate your time. We hope that we were able to bring some information and experience uh, to you. And um, be safe, everyone. And uh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.